All right, first question. Is, is there anyone here now who was not with us on Monday? And yes, to Tuesday. Definitely not here on Monday. Tuesday. Uh, I was here in spirit on Monday. But uh, uh, So anyone who was not here on Tuesday in the class and doesn't, most importantly, have syllabus for the course. So just the two of you here. That's one. Right, I won't, unfortunately for our two friends, I won't spend very long going through the syllabus again. We'll say a few things. But if you have, this is your chance to ask any questions if there was anything not clear or um, which you would like to have clarified since uh, Tuesday. So for those of you who were not here or for those of you who were not paying attention on uh, Tuesday, I'm sure there was none of you, uh, first page is a list of the topics that we'll be, we will be looking at during this semester. We have 13 topics there. They are weekly topics, week by week. And we will begin with the first topic, Late Rome and Germanic Invasions, on Tuesday next week. And I shall talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. Second page is a list of uh, the requirements. Everyone will do a presentation. You will all write two essays, and we shall start talking about essays today. And finally, uh, we will have weekly readings, weekly primary source readings. Again, I'll talk about that in a few minutes or later today. Uh, and you'll be expected to participate regularly. It may not be every week because there are lots of you here, but I will expect your thoughts and comments and I will be mentally and physically noting these down and they will contribute to your uh, final grade. The final page, third page, is a list of very general books about the Middle Ages or parts of the Middle Ages in Western Europe. And you uh, can use this as a reference point, as a starting point for any of the projects you do. Okay. Each week I will also give you, I have one for next week already, a bibliography of more specific works about the particular topics. But as I explained, when you're starting something new, a chapter perhaps or half a chapter from one of these books might be a general introduction and then you can start to focus in. Okay, any questions? Anyone got any problems from last week? No? Anything you wish to ask? All that's clear? Good. Uh, not last week, Tuesday. I'm getting myself very chronologically mixed up here. Um, okay, please put your hand up if there's anything you wish to ask uh, at any point during the uh, class, and I'll try and answer it at some point. Um, you will have noticed, those of you who've been reading your email or have been uh, enrolled on Moodle, that I don't have my guitar with me. Okay? It was Emre, I think, who mentioned to me, oh, someone said you play guitar sometimes. Uh, and I said, yes, but only usually in the Hijiv class, the first year undergraduate class. Then I thought, ah, here's an idea. Uh, we'll use this as a way to get people involved in the Moodle thing. So I sent an email, which all or most of you should have got, and then we put a little thing. I failed the first time, second time successfully to do a, a forum. And now there are 22, 23 people in the class. So my plan was, if I had 12 yeses of any description, which is kind of 50% or slight majority, then I would bring my guitar. But unfortunately, we only had 10 people who responded. So according to the rules of democracy and all that, I'm afraid... Big Bertha, my guitar, stays, well, in fact, she's in my office now, but uh, I'll take her home later on. So you'll have to take another course from me or something if you want to uh, hear the guitar. Okay, now we're all here. Can you please just put your name signatures here? I won't do this every week, but uh, just as a way of getting a sense of who's coming and so on. And if I count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, 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 and with Maria, who's not quite registered but will register, uh, that means there should be 23. So there's uh, a few people missing, but we'll um, follow them up as we go along. Okay. Last time, whenever that was, Tuesday, we talked uh, a lot about uh, the course and so on. I very briefly sketched that now. In order for you to kind of understand partly 
where I'm coming from in this course, what I'm hopefully trying to do with you all, uh, apart from make you all bored, uh, during the next 14 weeks. Uh, let's have a little bit of a discussion. And some of you probably uh, have kind of experienced a version of this before, but I think it's a very important thing for us to uh, come to grips with before we start the course proper. All right, can anyone give me a very brief single sentence uh, definition of what you think history is. What is history? We're all here to do some kind of history. Some of you because you want to become historians of some description, others because you thought this history course might be interesting for a few weeks, whatever it might be. We're going to be doing some kind of history for the following uh, three months or more. So let's understand first what is history and in the sense of what do historians people like me and hopefully some of you in the future, what do we spend our time doing? Any ideas? Anyone want to give me some? We can just start, we can put things gradually together as well. Okay, anyway, Morat was thinking, Fatih was thinking, I vaguely saw Morat's hand first. So. Well, to to uh, have an account of the past events in order to make meaning out of them. All right, okay. Uh, past events and some kind of meaning, okay. Uh, Fatih, do you want to add to that? Anything else? Uh, hist what historians uh, do. Uh, historians usually uh, fill the gaps uh, about the past events and uh, keep in mind Okay, gaps is an interesting thing. We can come to that. Anyone else? Young lady here. What's your name? Edja. Edgem, that's right. Yeah, not Buse Edgem. We said the other. Okay, I'll try and remember your names again. Okay, Burun. I think history is the documented style of the past. The documentation is the most important thing. Okay, yes, that's what I was hoping we'd get to gradually, but we've got there a little bit earlier. Okay, so let's put this word on here because this is the most important one. Okay, but then we might put Ama, but. Okay, think about that. Okay, so the past we're all clear about. The history has got something to do with things that happened in the past. Uh, there is a concept, contemporary history, which might sound anachronistic. How can you have something which is contemporary and history? But that means the historical account, or whatever it is, of kind of recent events, usually often politics in that sense. Okay. Um, events. Events. Now, what does that mean? Uh, an event, what can it mean here? Uh, is this table currently experiencing an event? Are you currently experiencing an event? People, okay, people make events happen. Now we sometimes talk about catastrophic climactic events or something like that, but in this context I'm sure what Fatih and uh, Murat both meant when they used that word was kind of human events. Okay, so we're connecting the past and we're connecting that with humans and human um, to a large extent kind of active uh, uh, interaction with themselves and with other parts of the world as well that create what we might call events. Okay, and obviously we're trying to understand these things. What Ejem has pointed to uh, early on is not what we're looking at and not what we try and do with those things, but our means, our method of reaching the past. Okay. Um, any of you watching Doctor Who? Anyone fans of the Dizzy, the series Doctor Who? I've been a great fan of Doctor Who since I was eight years old or something in England or whatever. But here is a guy, uh, an alien obviously, with a, with a time machine who can travel around and go back to the past and go into the future and so on. Now obviously time travel probably will never happen, I'm not going to get into that debate, but at the moment we're stuck here in the present, but we want to study the past. So the way we do that is by means of documents. Other people study the past, other people study the human past and things caused by humans, but they don't use documents. Archaeologists, for example, they uh, are studying the same kind of thing, and obviously even further back than historians can go, but their methods are different. They don't use, to a large extent, written documents, writing. They use 
what we call material remains, physical remains from the past. Then they try and study the meaning and fill in the gaps and find out what happened. Okay? Um, I spent one day as an archaeologist. I went on an archaeological dig in Britain after I finished my BA degree and I thought, I don't want to get a job for the summer, I'll be, go and do some archaeology. That's a bit like history while I was waiting to do my master's degree. And I had to cycle seven miles to the city near my village and I spent all day, because I was new, I'd never done any digging, so they didn't give me the bit with all the important stuff. They gave me a little bit in the corner, hard earth. I spent all day sort of scraping this stuff. My wrists came like this. And then I had to cycle seven miles back to my village again at 5.30 in the evening. So I phoned them up the next day and said, no, I think I'll just stick with books. I'll read uh, archaeology and books. Thank you very much. So I didn't go again. But um, So obviously they're a strange bunch of people that like to do these things in the rain and all sorts of stuff. But they are also studying the human past, human events, but they're using a different method to reach that past, okay? a different time machine or whatever it is to reach that past. We are using, to a large extent, documents. So in fact, what you've got in front of you, syllabus for the course, this is potentially an historical document. Imagine in 2,000 years' time, someone going through an archive and coming across this beautiful document here, prepared by me. And thinking, oh, what's this? Oh, look at this. This is the date on here or something. This is a very long time ago. And this is evidence of higher education in the Republic of Turkey at the beginning of the 21st century. And they'd put this together with other stuff. And they might use it. Everything we write, the emails we send, the text messages that we send off to our friends and so on, which also get lost most of these days, everything we write of one way or another is potentially an historical document. Okay. So what I want us to do uh, this semester is to look at the past, obviously, but I will be focusing every week, to some extent, upon how we study the past through primary sources, through the original documents. We had primary sources the other day. Okay. All right. So each week I will be giving you in English translation, a uh, few pages, sometimes more, sometimes less, of some document from the past which you must read, and then we will discuss it for about 20 minutes, and it's relevant to the topic. So, for example, for next week, when we're looking at the late Roman Empire and the Germanic invasions, as I've called them, uh, we shall read, it's a little bit earlier in fact, uh, the text called Germania, Germania by the uh, Roman writer Tacitus. Okay. And we shall read that uh, both as a source of what it tells us, but also a source of what it doesn't tell us and what it's trying to do. We shall analyze it uh, in a, a fairly skeptical kind of way, I hope. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit more about that text soon. Ama, but. Okay. It's not that simple. Life is never simple. Uh, if you are a medieval historian, if you are a classical ancient historian, uh, even if you are a modern historian to some extent, uh, you don't always have enough documents. My background is the early Middle Ages, uh, so before one th year 1000 for the British Isles, and particularly for the Celtic peoples. Wales, Scotland and Ireland is the area that I worked on originally. And compared to other parts of uh, uh, Europe and compared to the later period, there are not very many original primary sources that survive from uh, Wales during that period, for example. Uh, and many of them are very unreliable. They're written later and they're obviously telling uh, or making up stories for various reasons and so on. Many historians like me, uh, therefore are faced with a problem. What Fatty called the gaps are often much bigger than the bits that you have. Okay? And uh, the documents you have are insufficient or unreliable to fill in those gaps. So, sometimes, some historians, particularly from the earlier periods, have to look at non documentary sources to help them understand their past. Now we've mentioned archaeology already, okay, very, very 
important field. Some people would say history is just a branch of archaeology. Archaeology is studying all of the human past and history is just the recent past through documents or whatever. Um, but we are kind of cousin disciplines. We often work together and my experience for one day uh, reflects that. So sometimes to understand a society we don't have enough documents. We don't have enough documents to tell us what the relationship between people was, what the relationship between men and women were, how they organized their society. The documents don't exist or they've been lost or they're unreliable. But if we dig up the bones of people we can work out for example someone's buried here, someone's buried there, there must have been some connection. This person is more important than he was or here's a man and a woman, all sorts of stuff. What things they're wearing, and all things like that will begin to build up a picture of those people. So at some points during this semester, particularly the earlier period, the earlier weeks, we will do a little bit of archaeology. We'll look at, we won't literally go digging, I'm going to keep you in the classroom obviously, but we will look at things which are not really historical documents but are archaeological sources and we might think what can they tell us? And then the question there is of course how do we connect them up? How do we correlate? How do we coordinate historical with archaeology? They're saying, often saying different things, which is more reliable and so on. What else can we use to study the past? Documents written in the past, physical things created in the past which both survive, we can look at. There are other ways, less conventional, that we can use to understand the past. Now, any ideas? Anyone got any suggestions? We might have a go at some of these. Uh, yes, um, obviously I should have qualified that by saying the human past. Um, geological obviously is an even bigger time frame than archaeology going all the way back. Do you want to... You can tell like a, a rainfall of a given area and you can tell when there were droughts Very good point, okay. And um, uh, one thing that archaeologists use a lot of, uh, which is not quite geological, so we'll come back to that point, of course, is uh, dendrochronology. Anyone ever heard of dendrochronology? The rings around trees, okay. Trees grow more in nice weather and less in bad weather, and that tends to be the same uh, effect on all the trees in a certain area. So you can, tr you can connect various trees all the way back thousands of years, then you could correlate that with geological evidence. And obviously we are affected by the climate and things like that. So uh, yes, for the more recent past, I don't know how far we can kind of get the details, but for further back we definitely could, and the same dendrochronology is one way of looking at that. And so. Right. Or just uh, finding out the age of certain uh, farming, you know, certain, certain crops, the remains of crops and things like that. Yeah, it's not just the physical things we've created, such as plastic files or whatever it might be, or our bones that we leave under the ground. It's also the kind of world we interact with. Both of these points are connected there. In, in uh, uh, Ravel's case, it's more to do with the, uh, the world affecting us. In your case, you're looking at what we're doing. We, you can look at things moved around. The Romans, we know, for example, from archaeological evidence, bringing all sorts of things to the British Isles that didn't exist before. And we can study that and how that's happened and so on. So yes, these things are overlapping here. Um, things that exist today, things that exist now, things that exist in this room are also potentially historical sources. Now what have I been doing, what do I spend most of my time for three hours in the week doing, except when you're doing your presentations? What do I spend a lot of my time doing? And I should stop it and let you all have a chance to do that thing more often. What am I doing now? Talking, Talking okay, language, linguistics, okay? Languages don't just kind of come into existence, they evolve over time with groups of people speaking and they change over time as people interact. We are now speaking the English language which is kind of culturally, politically we might say uh, the most important language in the world at the moment. Who knows what might happen in the next thousand years but uh, that's the case now. Um, and we can study the English language, we can look at the words that we're using and we can understand how that language has evolved and by looking at the evolution of that language 
we are studying the people that spoke that language. Okay. I often see posters around campus. This is one of my little things. Um, from it must be the Turkish language society or club or something on campus. Okay, I don't know what it's called. And they're often got a little list of words, and it's basically saying, don't use these words, which are kind of European English words. Use these words, which are meant to be kind of proper Turkish words. They're all things to do with like click and things to do with computers and stuff like that. Now, uh, two issues here. Firstly, there is an assumption that somehow using a loan word borrowed from another language is somehow bad that the Turkish people are somehow suffering because they're saying click rather than, is it tıklayamak or something like that, or whatever, okay, there are better examples, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, and I don't know whether, the, or most, most of you are Turks here or whatever, I don't know uh, whether you feel that's the case, whether you somehow feel better as an individual or as a group if you use Turkic words. Many of the words that it says, don't use this word, use this word. It's an Arabic word anyway. It's just an old word that's been borrowed from Arabic or something. The English language, which I'm speaking, without giving you a chance to join in much, as we said, um, is very important. And people like me from Britain or America, we could feel very proud that somehow everyone is speaking English or whatever. The good thing, of course, is it means I don't have to learn foreign languages. Everyone's meant to learn English. But... Um, over 50% probably of the words in English are not Germanic Old English words. They've been borrowed from largely from French, they've been borrowed from Latin, and they've been borrowed from Greek, okay, over a certain period of time, basically back in the Middle Ages. We talked briefly, we mentioned briefly the Norman invasion of England. Those Frenchmen who were originally, they were Vikings, they came in 1066 and they took over England and gradually dominated their descendants, dominated the British Isles. After 1066, after the Norman invasion, Norman conquest of England, okay, gradually more and more French words during the Middle Ages became used in English. Now, I don't go around somehow feeling inferior that somehow, because every sentence I speak has got 40, 50, 60 percent French words mixed in. Okay? I don't feel somehow less than that. Okay? So, that's my one little point there. But importantly, we can study, therefore, the language we speak today. We can look at the words we're using and we can say they are caused by events in the past. Even if we don't have historical sources, even if for some reason historical sources were wiped out and we don't know anything about 1066, as long as we know about English and French, we would say, wait a minute, look at all these words here. They're not Germanic. They're not the things that were spoken by the uh, Anglo-Saxons or whatever. Where have they come from? They come from somewhere. They've come from French. That means the French s had some dominance over English at some point. It could be political, it could be cultural, or whatever. Okay, so there's one thing. Let's add that one. Language. All right. Also, the related to language is place name. Okay. Well, yeah. Onomastics is the study of names of all sorts, and most importantly, uh, place and we can say personal names, part of that, okay. And again, in the, uh, thank you out, that's a good point, in the uh, early Middle Ages, a lot of people used the study of, especially place names, to study the societies that uh, created those names, that lived in those societies and so on. We can understand the Anglo-Saxons invading Britain by looking at the names of towns and villages in England even today. We can work out where they come from and things like that. And we will be doing this for the earlier part. We shall look at onomastic evidence that tells us about migrations and things like that. Okay? And personal names, slightly different, but the names we give to each other tell us something. Take, because I like to talk about myself. David. Okay. What do we know about my name? Why am I called David, do you think? Sorry? It's the name of uh, an ancient Hebrew prophet, okay, in the Old Testament, in the uh, uh, Jewish holy books and so on originally. As far as I know, I have no uh, Israeli 
uh, Hebrew Jewish uh, ancestors and so on. So why am I called David? Why have we got this name for me? Saint David was a, uh, and when I'm a nice boy, sometimes people call me Saint David because I've been good. Right? Saint David was a probably 6th century holy man, Christian, living in the southern part of Wales. He's a very good example of someone we know a little bit about. We've got lots written about him, but most of it is completely unreliable and untrue. So we don't actually know much about him at all. But he was uh, the founder of an important church and group of uh, churches in uh, South Wales. And later, because his churches became powerful, bless you, Chok Yesha, uh, his churches became powerful. He became the patron saint of Wales. He became the, the main saint. You know about St. Patrick. The Irish like St. Patrick, okay, and they all drink uh, green Guinness and things at certain points in the year. Well, the equivalent man for my bit of the Celtic lands is David, okay? The Welsh form of uh, the name is David, okay? And I come from Wales, and so I presume my parents, because of a Welsh idea rather than because of something to do with an ancient Jewish prophet, called me David, okay? So you can look at my name and it's possible to say something about me. So we can do the same by looking at names of people in the past. Okay? Now one name doesn't necessarily mean very much at all because one name can be crazy. Like you know, pop stars and film stars today, David Beckham or whatever, his wife, uh, giving these ridiculous names uh, to their children. And if you're watching David, sorry about that. Um, but um, if you take lots of names, if you look in the historical documents and you go through and look at lots of names, then you can see patterns. Once again, just to take the same example, after 1066, people began to stop using Anglo-Saxon names. Okay? Very few names from the Anglo-Saxon period survive. Edward is still one. Okay? You don't meet many people called Edgar. Alfred there's probably more Alfredos around than there are English Alfreds and American Alfreds and so on. Okay. There's a small number of these names which survive, but you don't get people called Ethelred and Athelstan and things anymore and ladies called Athelflythe and all this kind of stuff. They've all gone. People began to use Norman French names because they wanted to have fashionable names like the cultural people who were dominating their society. So again, looking at names, Place names, or in this case, personal names from the past, can tell us about the society. One of my favourite ones, and I share this interest with the president of Bill Kent University, Ali Dora Marja, uh, some other way that we can, and all of us here, every single person in here, is a walking historical document in this broader sense of the word. And again, I suspect Alps had the pleasure of doing this kind of stuff before. So before I let him answer the question, anyone guess? Each person here is potentially, or in reality, a document about the human past. Hmm? Memories. Memories? Well, that's individual. Okay, interesting. Now, okay, we'll come back to that. That's not what I'm after here. We're talking less sort of personally, more physically here. Uh, any ideas? No? Help? Genetics. DNA. Okay. We all have the bits and pieces from our parents that we've inherited and we blame them for the funny nose, whatever it might be. I've got this thing on here, my chin from my father, for example. Um, but more seriously, we all inherit our DNA from our parents. They inherited the DNA from their parents, our grandparents, and we carry it all the way back. Okay? DNA is mixed and shifted all the time, so it's hard to uh, trace, except particularly for two kinds of DNA, which is not regularly lost and shifted. You're guaranteed that that will pass on. Do you know from your biology lessons or whatever, okay, and we're talking about the two halves of the, uh, uh, of the class here. Yeah, okay, the X comes and goes, but the Y chromosome, which us guys have, and sorry ladies, you don't have one, ha ha, but the Y chromosome is inherited 
in theory, unchanged from your father. And he got it from his father, who got it from his father ad infinitum. Okay? So it's possible to study the Y chromosomes of people living today and then to compare that with a large population and then to work out what's going on. You can say, you don't belong here. You've got a different... Oh, everyone in this class... Okay, what's your name? Remember you? Berk. Berk. Everyone in, all the guys in this class have got a certain kind of Y chromosome. Berk has got a slightly different one. There's some mutation or some difference. So clearly his ancestors came from somewhere else. Everyone else is probably local or whatever, things like that. Okay, we can study, therefore, in terms of the male part of the population. Now, we can do a similar but slightly different thing with the ladies. Do we know what that is? Mitochondrial DNA, sometimes written like that, okay? We all have, yes, the source of the energy in the cells. We all have mitochondrial DNA. It's not like X and Y where you, the ladies don't have the Y. Mitochondrial DNA, we all get it. We all get it from our mothers, okay? Which means the men don't pass it on, but the ladies do. So my mother's mitochondrial DNA, which is in me, has not gone on to my children, okay? It stops here, except my, I have a sister, so she's been passing hers on. Um, but the ladies pass it on. So just as we can study the male ancestors of a, a society through the Y chromosome, we can do a similar thing through people's mitochondrial DNA. And we all have that. It's not just the men as well. Okay. So then you can study these things. So, for example, here's a question. Uh, anyone know who the Parsis, sometimes spelt with an I, are? Who are the Parsis? Anyone have heard of the Parsis? Where do they live? It's a kind of cultural and religious group. They are living in uh, the Indian region of Gujarat, uh, particularly focused on Bombay. We're supposed to call it Mumbai these days, aren't we? Uh, and they are Zoroastrians. Who or what are Zoroastrians? Zerdushtis. Okay, followers of the ancient prophet Zoroaster, very early monotheistic uh, thinker. And they originated in Central Asia and what is now Iran, okay, associated with Iranian heritage. But with the coming of Islam, okay, largely wiped out. But there are still people who would we call Zoroastrians living in Iran. But with the arrival of Islam, some of them migrated down, sailed off, and ended up on the west coast of India and settled there. Okay? And today their uh, descendants still live there, and they are the Parsis. They don't speak uh, an Iranian language anymore. They probably spend most of their time speaking Gujarati or something. But they're there, and they, and, uh, they, they um, have their own community. They've done some DNA testings of the Parsi community, okay, which is fairly kind of isolated culturally, I suppose, and they found that the Y chromosomes of the Parsis were largely Iranian, very similar to the Y chromosomes they could find in what is now Iran. The mitochondrial DNA of the Parsis, however, was largely from the subcontinent of India. Okay, so that suggests a number of things. We come into the interpretation side, our word meaning later, but it on the face of it, it suggests a bunch of men left and went and settled in India, left the women behind, okay, and then intermarried with uh, ladies from the local community and made them become Zoroastrians and so on, and that's the basis for their community. So uh, if that interpretation is correct, and it may not be, okay, we can use the Y chromosomes of people living today to understand a little bit more about what happened in 7th, 8th, 9th centuries uh, in Iran and in India and things like that. That's one example. Fatty mentioned memories. What do we mean by that? Right, okay. Things which you uh, experience personally and which you obviously remember. And perhaps we can connect your idea of memories to something else which we won't be doing much of in this course, of course. Another area that doesn't involve written documents, oral history. Going in... Hmm? Folklore is connected to that, okay? Oral tradition uh, of societies passed on stories and things, they may reach back to the past. Memories in a personal, individual sense, you can go and speak to people and interview them about life 
in the 1960s or something like that. That might not seem very historical to us, but it's memories people give out. It's different evidence than what we might get in written documents. You can go and interview famous politicians about their experiences. You can do contemporary history through that. Maybe folkloric oral tradition things from uh, groups of societies may tell us a bit more about what's gone on before. The best example of that, I think, roots. Anyone seen the great TV series from the 70s, Roots, Conta Kinte, I Am a Mandinga Warrior and all that, okay. There was a story passed down over generation to generation about the original African who was captured and taken to uh, what is now the United States, but then was part of the British Empire. And it was passed down and down. And uh, the... Uh, his descendant then found that he had, well, Alex Haley, wasn't it? His, uh, Alex Haley found out about, or oh, heard this, and then connected it to some stories that were, were continuing to be passed down in Africa and tried to connect his ancestor with some stories uh, that were uh, existing in parts of Africa at the time and built up a whole story, which may or may not be true, but it's a good example of both personal things but long-term oral history reaching into the past as well. Now, for the Middle Ages, it's more difficult. It's so far back thousand years or something that we don't often use kind of oral historical methods to understand that t uh, time um, but we can use archaeology we can use language we can use um, zoological geological evidence as we said we can use DNA as well which we should be doing all right uh, I also think of actually objects passed on uh, in a family uh, from generation to generation yeah okay Some things that of own. Haven't been ended up under the ground yes. uh, for archaeologists to find, but can be passed on. Yeah, I'm sure there are those as well. That's uh, that's fair yeah, enough. Okay. Mm, well, we hear about the, actually, the details of a certain object in the family from our ancestors, and then we have to go through. Well, it's similar. It's not. I mean, oral obviously means speaking and words here, yeah. spoken words. So that's a bit different. I don't know what. Maybe there's a term for this. I'm not even sure what that might be. But it's. Uh, uh, and it's not archaeology either, is it? And so on. Connected to that, of course, is architecture. Buildings which survive uh, and haven't ended up being destroyed, so we're just digging up the holes of them, as archaeologists usually do. But, uh, for example, industrial archaeology. Okay, studying the Industrial Revolution 200 years ago by looking at the buildings that survived from them. That's another thing we can do. Gosh, it's 25 past two already. It's time flies when you're talking a lot, doesn't it? Okay, Fatty, you wanted to? No? Uh, yes, I mean that's uh, depends. I mean, again, it's like looking at language. Of course, to some extent, if you look at spoken language, then you're not doing historical thing. If you look at written genealogy, which is what I did in my PhD thesis, then of course you're looking at historical written genealogies. So uh, it's kind of it's part of history in that sense, I suppose. DNA gives you a, a physical genealogy, but you may not know who all the people are there. So um, if we're looking at written language, then of course we're looking at historical sources. So it's a uh, it's a similar problem. Okay, so what we're going to be doing um, in the next few weeks is looking at the Middle Ages from round about before the year 500 down to the time of the Renaissance, and particularly for the earlier period when we have very few sources comparatively, we will occasionally make use of archaeological evidence, onomastic evidence, even genetic evidence, to see if they can help us understand what really happened, because the historical sources are not enough, or they're unreliable for one reason or another. Okay, so that's the point of all this talk now. Um, right, that went on quite longer than I intended, uh, and I did. I've got a plan to talk about what is the Middle Ages. So, uh, okay, let's have a break. Five minutes early, but if I if I delay the break, you might all get upset or something. So uh, let's have a break now, and then we'll resume slightly early at 25 to three. Okay. about uh, the course and so on, I very briefly sketch that now. In order for you to kind of understand partly where I'm coming from in this course, what I'm hopefully trying to do with you all, uh, apart from make you all bored, uh, during the next 14 weeks, uh, let's have a little bit of a discussion. And some of you probably uh, have kind of experienced a version of this before. But I think it's a very important thing for us to uh, come to grips with before we start the course proper. 
All right, can anyone give me a very brief single sentence uh, definition of what you think history is. What is history? We're all here to do some kind of history. Some of you because you want to become historians of some description, others because you thought this history course might be interesting for a few weeks, whatever it might be. We're going to be doing some kind of history for the following uh, three months or more. So let's understand first what is history and in the sense of what do historians people like me and hopefully some of you in the future, what do we spend our time doing? All right, first question, is, is there anyone here now who was not with us on Monday? And yes, to Tuesday, definitely not here on Monday, Tuesday. Uh, I was here in spirit on Monday, but uh, uh, so anyone who was not here on Tuesday in the class and doesn't, most importantly, have syllabus for the course. So just the two of you here. That's one. Right, I won't unfortunately for our two friends, I won't spend very long going through the syllabus again. We'll say a few things. But if you have, this is your chance to ask any questions, if there was anything not clear or um, which you would like to have clarified since uh, Tuesday. So for those of you who were not here, or for those of you who were not paying attention on uh, Tuesday, I'm sure there was none of you, uh, first page is a list of the topics that we'll be, we will be looking at during this semester. We have 13 topics there. They are weekly topics, week by week. And we will begin with the first topic, Late Rome and Germanic Invasions, on Tuesday next week. And I shall talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. Second page is a list of uh, the requirements. Everyone will do a presentation. You will all write two essays, and we shall start talking about essays today. And finally, uh, we will have weekly readings, weekly primary source readings. Again, I'll talk about that in a few minutes or later today. Uh, and you'll be expected to participate regularly. It may not be every week, because there are lots of you here, but I will expect your thoughts and comments, and I will be mentally and physically noting these down, and they will contribute to your uh, final grade. The final page, third page, is a list of who's this, as a way to get people involved in the Moodle thing. So I sent an email, which all or most of you should have got, and then we put a little thing. I failed the first time, second time successfully to do a, a forum, and now there are 22, 23 people in the class, so my plan was if I had 12 yeses of any description, which is kind of 50% or slight majority, then I would bring my guitar. But unfortunately, we only had 10 people who responded. So according to the rules of democracy and all that, I'm afraid... Big Bertha, my guitar, stays, well, in fact, she's in my office now, but uh, uh, I'll take her home later on. So you'll have to take another course from me or something if you want to uh, hear the guitar. Okay, now we're all here. Can you please just put your name signatures here? I won't do this every week, but uh, just as a way of getting a sense of who's coming and so on. And if I count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Eighteen people. And with Maria, who's not quite registered but will register, uh, that means there should be 23. So there's uh, a few people missing, but we'll um, follow them up as we go along. Okay. Last time, whenever that was, Tuesday, we talked uh, a lot of very general books about the Middle Ages or parts of the Middle Ages in Western Europe. And you uh, can use this as a reference point, as a starting point, for any of the projects you do. Okay. Each week I will also give you, I have one for next week already, a bibliography of more specific works about the particular topics. But as I explained, when you're starting something new, a chapter perhaps or half a chapter from one of these books might be a general introduction and then you can start to focus in. Okay, any questions 
Anyone got any problems from last week? No? Anything you wish to ask? All that's clear? Good. Uh, not last week, Tuesday. I'm getting myself very chronologically mixed up here. Um, OK, please put your hand up if there's anything you wish to ask uh, at any point during the uh, class, and I'll try and answer it at some point. Um, you will have noticed, those of you who've been reading your email or have been uh, enrolled on Moodle, that I don't have my guitar with me. Okay, it was Emre, I think, who mentioned to me, oh, someone said you play guitar sometimes. Uh, and I said, yes, but only usually in the Hijif class, the first year undergraduate class. Then I thought, ah, here's an idea. Uh, we'll 